We're glad you're with us. Uh, this is part two of Introduction to the Bible, and we'll talk about uh, what, we are, what we're going to do. Um, if you don't know, I'm Jeff Frazier, lead pastor at Chapel Street. This is Laura Terrell. Hello. She's a director of groups and classes, and uh, both of us are very passionate about the Word of God and about helping other people discover God through His Word, and that's what the heart of these, this two-part series is about. So, but to start off, Laura's going to lead us through a fun exercise. Yes. And you pick the worst possible spot to sit there. I know, you're going to be blinded. <laughs> you're going to be blinded right there. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to invite 12 non-volunteers. We've volunteered you, you know, for you're us. You're predestined for this you're role. You're predestined for this role. We're going to invite you up, and I'm, it's really easy. I'm going to hand you a card and make you stand here. So it's really easy. So hopefully you guys are in the room. So Steve Lemon, <laughs> Steve Witt, Sterling Moore, if you Sterling? hear your name, come on up. You chose Vince Sterling? Roland. I did. I Vince. know. Bethany Samuelitz. I know. Yes. You're, you're lucky. Come on down. Linnea you can be the next big winner Miley. on The Price is Right. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Linnea, there you go. Um, Haley and Owen Taro, come on up. <laughs> Ed Katinsky, if you're in here. Tom Joy, you guys have to stand in a line down front. Hand these out. Yeah. Betsy Fallon. And Angie Bateman, is she So if your here? name was called, come on up Angie, and stand, up. stand from where Steve is around the front of the stage. Doesn't matter the order. Oh. Yeah, Here's in a line. Here's one. <laughs> Here's on. one. Stand right down in Here's front. Here's one. Here's one. You gotta stand right there. No, I don't want to stand yeah. I, this is, blame Laura. Steve? Oh, sorry, Ed. <laughs> Steve? Okay. All right, this is gonna be interactive. So this is crowd participation. Okay, so once you guys have your envelopes, Come you might have up. to scoot in. Stretch out all the way down there. All the way down. Sorry. Okay, go ahead and take your word out of the envelope. Let's put you. And we'll collect your envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> take your envelopes. We're going to put you guys in order. So what we're doing, these are 12 events from the Bible that mark out kind of the art, overriding arch of the storyline of the Bible, and we need to put you in chronological order. So hopefully through the magic of preparation, you're not already in order. So hold them up so I people can see I try to be random. Them. Okay. You got to hold it so people can see, Ed. There you go. All right. So which out of these 12 comes first? Creation. Creation. So you guys got to switch. And then what comes next after the creation? The fall. Okay. So Bethany, come down. Oh, poor Bethany got the fall. I know. <laughs> Okay, so this is when it starts to get tricky. Hold them up so everybody can see. What comes after the fall? Hmm. Well, Abraham and Isaac, that's going to be close. So why don't, Angie, why don't you come down this way? But I think we still have one that comes before. It might be a little tricky because it says covenant, but that's covenant with Abraham. So Haley, come on down. You're in between Bethany and Angie. You guys want to move down. Make room for it. Yeah. Okay, so we have creation, the fall, covenant, Abraham and Isaac, so Exodus, yeah, Exodus, come on down. We've got all the ladies in a row here. We're working the way through down. Okay, after Exodus, let's see. What's I next? Think you're, I think Sterling's in the right place. How Exile about that? Return. That never happens, Sterling in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, wait, we need the kingdom age. Uh. Kingdom age. So wait a minute, come on, Tom, you're going to interrupt Linnea and Sterling here. Okay. Sterling wasn't in the right place. Kingdom age, exile and return. This so that's the end of the Old Testament. So now we get into the New Testament. Birth of Jesus. So, oh, and you come stand next to Sterling. Okay. And Vince, I think you're already in the right place. The baptism and life of Jesus. Death and resurrection. Return of Jesus and the church age. Oh, church age and return of Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, I messed that up. So you guys did it. Okay, so let's, let's just see so we can... Get these in our head. We've got creation, the fall, God's covenant with Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, the Exodus, the kingdom age, exile and return, birth of Jesus, baptism and life of Jesus, death and resurrection of Jesus, the church age, and the return of Jesus. Good job, guys. Way to go. And you get to keep those pieces of paper. Forever. Just to remember how well awesome this was. I know. Thank you, guys. Bethany, you can trade yours for anybody else. <laughs> sure. Good job. So if you're wondering, those 12 um, story titles uh, are taken from a book written by um, a man named William Shoemaker, not the famous jockey, but who was a missionary, and he developed what he called chronological Bible storying. How do you get the major stories of the Bible to people that are illiterate in Africa and other parts of the world? 
you tell stories. They're a narrative, or, oral culture, storytelling culture. So he developed, basically, there's, it's scriptural, but stories on those themes, and told them over and over and over again to people. Then tested some of the elders in these villages. Just all they had done was memorize these stories out of the Bible, and they could test better on basic theological questions and doctrinal questions than first-year seminary students, just by knowing the stories mm -hmm. and they, what they learn about who God is through those stories. So that's, those are what those 12 stories, those titles come from. But they're really, you could make 24, you could make 32, you could make 10. The point is the, the, the major narrative movements through the story of the Bible. Okay, um, N Mortimer Adler, you all know who he is? That's what I thought. No. Nope. He wrote a book called How to Read a Book. I recommend it to you. And in his, the basic thesis of his book is, in order to read a book properly, you need to answer four questions as you read. One, what's the book about as a whole? Two, what is said in detail in the book? Three, is the book true in whole or in part? And four, how do you know that it is true? Um, I think if you think about those four things, that's really what we've kind of organized these two uh, weekends about. Last... Sunday was about the first, the second two questions. Is it true in whole or in part, and how do you know that it's true? We're going to answer the first two tonight. What is it about in, as, a, as a whole and in detail as well? Last week we said that the Bible is 66 books written in three different languages on three different continents over 1,500 years, written by kings and shepherds, by poets, by prophets, by generals and fishermen, written in a variety of genres. Laura talked to us about poetry and prophecy and literature and letters and narrative and history and, and apocalyptic literature. And yet, despite all of that diversity, it's one cohesive, beautiful, unified story. And we're gonna talk specifically this week about what that story is. So we're gonna talk through some of those things you just saw up here. First, uh, we are looking at, as we just talked about, the creation. The creation account is a story of how God created everything that exists out of nothing, ex nihilo, this, the scholars tell us. And he created us, human beings, in his image. Those two things are crucial to understanding the whole story of the Bible. In the beginning, God created everything from nothing by the power of his word, his voice. He spoke things into existence. And he created man in his image, men and women, to be his image bearers, crown, as it were, of all creation. All God made is good. He called it very good. He lived in perfect harmony with man and woman. And that the part of the Bible establishes these important foundational truths. God made it. God made it good. God made us to be in relationship with him in his image. And then we come to Genesis 3 through 9. That's Genesis 1 through 2. 3 through 9 is the fall. You better answer. The Holy Spirit's calling. <laughs> you don't want to leave him hanging. This is how the story of humans rejected God. This is how we made, how we ruined all that God made good by our rebellion, by our sin, by our pride. And if you remember, if you know, if you know the story, of course, God made it all good, he gave, but inside the goodness of God were parameters for our good, things we could not do, or trans, boundaries we couldn't cross, for our good, not because God is a killjoy, but for our good. And you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we did. And the lie the serpent told was, if you eat of it, you'll be like God, which was both, it was both partly true. We are created to be like God, Ephesians tells us, in true righteousness and holiness. But it was a lie that we were not meant to be God by grasping it for ourselves, but by letting him transform us. And so the first sin, right, is believing that lie, pride, to be like God, wanting our own way to be our own God. That's the fall. And then comes, we talked about covenant. God, uh, even though we're, we, we have, are out of the good garden, we are no longer in the goodness of original creation. Uh, East of Eden, John Steinbeck's novel, essentially, we're cast out right? And we can't go back. That's what the flaming sword and the cherubim at the, at the garden means. You can't go backwards. You can only go forward. And where do we go now that we're cast out from God's presence in the garden? Covenant is the beginning of God making a way back for his people to be in relationship with him by, the, by a promise. That's, I always tell young ones at the communion table at Monday, Thursday, and, Holy, and Good Friday Holy Communion services, when I say this is the covenant of, the, of new covenant, they say, and I said, you know what covenant is? And mostly they go, it's just a fancy Bible word for promise, I tell him. That's God's promise. And so here he comes to a man named Abram and makes a covenant, a promise with him that he's going to establish th through this man a people that he can dwell with. Uh, and then, of course, Abraham and Isaac, the well-known, often misunderstood story, is really key to understanding how the life of faith works. It gives us hints about how God will ultimately provide the perfect substitute, but that's foreshadowing. We'll leave that for now. <laughs> All right. 
Continuing on, uh, we have the Exodus. So God made these promises to Abraham that he's going to develop him into a nation of people. He's going to send him um, a multitude of descendants. So that happens over time. The Israelites become a huge nation of people, and they are enslaved in Egypt. So that's the Exodus story, is how God makes this promise to his people after they've been in slavery for 400 years. He sends Moses to be their liberator, to pull them out of uh, Egypt. And there's a whole process. So there's, you know, the plagues. Um, God goes, sends Moses to Pharaoh, to the king of Egypt, and says, let my people go. If you've seen the 12 Commandments movie around Easter, you're familiar with this. It's kind of mm-hmm. kind of campy. But um, Pharaoh has a hard heart, and he keeps saying, no, he doesn't want to let the people go. But Moses keeps going back, and they keep having this interchange. Um, and God proves his sovereignty over every, everything, every Egyptian God. Um, and finally, that culminates in the Passover. And that's the story where the Israelites uh, sacrificed a lamb and they ate the meat and they painted the blood over the doorposts of their house. And the angel of the Lord came through and um, every house that had the blood on the door, the angel passed over that house and didn't do anything. But the houses that didn't have the blood on the door Uh, the angel killed the firstborn child. So that affected the Egyptians, but the Israelites that had the blood on the door were not affected, and that was sort of the thing that changed Pharaoh's mind, uh, where he allowed the Israelites to leave. Mm -hmm. So that's the Passover. That's what we celebrate um, in in a changed form when we celebrate communion, that idea of a substitute death. Um, making it possible for us to go free. So the Exodus story is the people of Israel leaving Egypt as a great nation, moving out of slavery in Egypt. And then the kingdom age, so they were the Israelites left Egypt and headed for the promised land. So the promised land, the Bible has this theme of the land and the promised land, this place of peace and rest that God was going to give his people. And they moved into that land and were established. This is, you know, summarizing many hundreds of years of history. Mm-hmm. But God gave them kings to rule over them and there was a time of peace, but Jeff and I were joking about this. You can summarize the history of the kings as Good king, bad king, very bad king, repeat until exile. So they had this series of kings. You know, some of them were good, some of them were bad, some of them were really bad. Um, and finally, God stepped in, and the, things had become so corrupt mm-hmm. um, that he allowed surrounding nations to overtake the Israelites and to send them into exile, to go where they didn't want to go, to leave the land of promise and to go back to a land of captivity. Um, so that's the exile. And then after 70 years in exile, God allowed them to return again to the promised land. Now, if you're wondering, by the way, where most of the prophets in the Old Testament fit, like they are kind of in their own section. Someone asked last week why the Bible's organized the way it is. Why isn't it all chronological? The latter kingdom age and exile is the primary period of the prophets, if you're wondering. That's when they're, God is speaking to his people, warning them about what's going to happen, and then pro- prophesying to them about his Eventual, their eventual return and restoration. And I tend to think that the exile is probably the most uh, overlooked section of the Bible. It's a huge chunk of the Old Testament, but it tends to be the section we know the least about. Mm-hmm. Okay. We did a series on the Minor Prophets a couple years ago called Who Are These Guys? <laughs> on that, for that very reason. So um, on that note, Laura mentioned a couple things that are really important. If you're new to the story of the Bible, that, that there's themes we're going to develop, and you should always be listening for these themes. The Exodus story is the central narrative of the people of Israel, even today. That's the moment. Moses leading the people out of bondage, out of captivity, into freedom. That becomes the central metaphor that Jesus will use to talk about his deliverance, the ultimate deliverance to all people out of slavery and bondage. So you see these threads that come through, even the kings, right? This longing for a king to lead us perfectly and the inability, as Laura mentioned, for these human kings to get that right. We have a longing for a true king. Jesus is the true king. So there are these threads that come through the biblical story that lead us all the way to, the, 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 to Jesus, ultimately. Um, and then you have this sort of gap where the Bible's silent, 400 years, where no prophet speaks, and th- there's not much going on, at least in terms of the written part of the canon, but God, God is preparing to do something remarkable, and we have the birth of Jesus. This, you know, I debate with friends, is the incarnation or the resurrection the key moment of our faith? What do you say, Laura? Oh, man. Right. I, there's, I don't know, you could make an argument for both, right? The incarnation, the birth of Jesus, God taking on flesh. You ever see Aladdin? 
awesome power. Living space. Remember that he says that, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like that. The God of the universe in human flesh and blood baby. But then the resurrection, it's the ultimate defeat of sin and death. It's the ultimate deliverance. So these two things, uh, I'm ahead of myself. Birth of Jesus, that's good. <laughs> and then baptism of Jesus. We talked about this this week. Uh, if you were here, uh, any of our campuses and heard about, uh, a little bit about this, Jesus goes to be baptized by John the Baptist, not because he needs to repent of sin, he was sinless and perfect, but to identify himself with sinful people for whom he came to save, and because it's fitting to fulfill all scripture and prophecy. He's baptized in the Jordan River, and at that baptism, what happens? The spirit descends in the form of a dove, the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son. You have Father, Son, and Spirit in one of the most clear places in all scripture right there at his baptism. That's why it's listed and so important. Um, and then, so there's, there's a lot of references to the kingdom of God in the Gospels. Now, remember, we talked about kingdom. W- what is the kingdom of God, by the way? How would you define kingdom of God? What is it? It's the, simply put, it's the rule and reign of Jesus. Wherever Jesus Christ rules and reigns in a human heart, in a community, in a church family, in a, in a, in a nuclear family, among two friends, wherever Jesus rules and reigns, there is his kingdom. So we live in a world in which there, his kingdom is present, isn't it? But it's not fully realized, is it? You can find evidences in your own life of the goodness and grace of his kingdom in your heart and in your family. You can find evidences of the, of the fact that his kingdom is not fully here, is it? This is what theologians call the already not yet reality of our time, the church age. Am I ahead of myself? I, I, <laughs> Laura, why don't you take it? Death and resurrection is awesome also. <laughs> Laura, you go. Okay. You go. The church age. Um, so after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven um, and left his disciples to carry on his ministry. So the church age is the history of the church. It's this growth of gospel people celebrating Christ and moving out into the world and spreading the gospel. Uh, so the church age is, is we're, in, we're still in the church mm-hmm. age. Um, this is an ongoing process, but it begins in the book of Acts in the New Testament, really tells this story. You have the missionary journeys of Paul um, are included in the development of the church age, and you see the gospel exploding and impacting the world and changing lives, changing communities, Mm -hmm. and and it also raises a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this quite a bit in the Ephesians story or series, but um, Jewish Christians who had grown up with this history, the long history of the Old Testament that understood a particular way of relating to God. And then you had Gentile believers um, who encountered Christ and wanted to follow him. And then how do you take these two groups of people and form them into one community? Uh, So the church age wrestled with a lot of these questions. We're still in some ways wrestling with Mm -hmm. a lot of the same questions, um, but that's the development of people into a Christian community, learning how to live together and how to serve God together. So we're currently in the church age, and we're waiting for what Jeff was calling the not yet, and that's the Mm -hmm. return of Jesus. So we long for that. We long for his return, and we're told that when he returns, it will be the culmination of human history. Jesus will return um, to bring his followers into eternal relationship with him, and those who have not followed him will go to eternal separation Mm -hmm. from him. So he's given us this time. Um, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we wonder why this long period of time between the resurrection of Jesus and his return. Uh, It seems like it's been 2,000 years. That feels like a long time, but God is being patient with us to give us time to come to him and to be restored into relationship with him. He does things in his time. Yeah, and we're still waiting. I, I forgot something. If you go back up to death and resurrection of Jesus, do you know what's in your notes? It says J-R-R-T and C-S-L. Do you see that? You know who that is? J-R-R Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And then the Eucatastrophe. Do you have that in your notes or not? Mm-hmm. Is that just me? Yeah. The Eucatastrophe, who knows what that means? This is a, a good concept. So catastrophe, you know what that word means, right? This is something terrible, bad happens that you didn't see coming. Like, it's a catastrophe. Who, U is the prefix, Greek prefix for good. So the good catastrophe. What's the good catastrophe of the Bible story? The cross, cross, right? The most catastrophic thing in history that God would die, a condemned criminal on trumped up charges, 
God turns into the most beautiful thing in human history, mm-hmm. the you catastrophe. They, they coined this phrase as like, you know, in any good story, there's the unsought, like, oh, the, the sudden turn, which is often for bad. It, it creates tension. But the gospel is the sudden unexpected turn for good. The resurrection, who saw that coming? Not even Jesus' closest followers, right? Mm-hmm. That's what that was there for. Okay. Now we're going to show you another video uh, from the Bible Project. I mentioned this last week when we were together. The Bible Project, if you, they have a great podcast, a great website, and a wonderful series of videos. I mean, I don't even know how many they have. I tons. don't know, it's a lot. But this last week was on what is the Bible. This one is a short one about what is the Bible all about. So let's watch this together. The Bible is an important book, but it's really long. Yeah, it's a collection of many books written over a long period of time, but altogether they tell one unified story. So, what's the story of the Bible? Well, it begins by introducing us to a beautiful mind, the author of all reality, a being called God. And he has the power to take the dark chaos of the uncreated world and bring about order and beauty and a garden full of life. And to crown this accomplishment, God appoints these creatures called humanity. Or in Hebrew, Adam. And they're made as God's image. Which means that they're commissioned to rule this beautiful world on God's behalf by harnessing all of its potential and creating even more beauty and order. This is a story about humans using their power to do meaningful, life-giving work. But the question is, How? Yeah, humanity now faces a choice that's represented by a fruit tree. So humans could partner with God and find freedom by trusting in his knowledge of good and evil. Or they could seize power and define good and evil on their own, which, God warns, will kill them. And they hear the voice of a dark, mysterious creature that tells them the choice is simple. Take the fruit. It'll give you power and freedom to rule the world on your own terms. And so they seize this knowledge, and as a result, they become suspicious and self-protective. It leads to fractured relationships, violent power grabs, and ultimately, a whole civilization, Babylon, that has redefined evil as good. And so, God scatters this corrupted human project. And here the story of the Bible takes an important turn. We zoom in to the story of a man and a woman who come out of Babylon, Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, God promises that from them will come a new people, a nation that has another chance to make the right choice. And if they succeed, it will open up this new way forward for the rest of humanity. And this is why the rest of the Bible story is about this family. And it does not go well. Despite God's personal guidance, Abraham's family gives in to that same temptation to redefine good and evil on their own terms, apart from God. Even when their best people were in charge, rulers who loved God's guidance and had divine wisdom, even they gave in. And so Israel was warned by their own prophets that these choices would lead them back to Babylon, this time as conquered captives living in exile, and that's exactly what happened. So even with God's personal guidance, Israel fails. Who can succeed? Well, the prophet said that the story wasn't over. God's going to send a new leader to Israel to cover for their failures and to transform the people's hearts and minds so that they can make the right choice. And so the part of the Bible called the Old Testament ends, and these promises are left hanging. And then the biblical story continues into the New Testament. We're introduced to a man who comes from the line of Israel's kings, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said that he was bringing all these promises to their completion. He confronted that dark, mysterious evil that all humanity has given into and resisted its power. And then he announced that God had arrived to rule the world through himself. Jesus taught about God's definition of good and evil, and he said that real power is serving others. According to Jesus, it's people who love the poor and even love their enemies. These are the kinds of people who actually rule the world. And that's confusing, but also really beautiful. And so is the claim that the story goes on to make about Jesus, that he is God become human, to be for Israel and for all humanity what we could never be for ourselves. He came to take the consequences of our evil into himself, and his sacrificial love proved more powerful than evil, than even death itself. So now humanity's presented with a new choice. Represented by a new tree. Stick with the old way of being human, or venture into this new way. And in the story, those who choose the way of Jesus find themselves energized by God's own power. People who know that they are loved and forgiven by God can become people who love and forgive others in return. 
The Jesus movement quickly spread throughout the world, forming these new communities of people who follow the way of Jesus. But they faced problems. There was persecution from the outside by people in power, and inside there was confusion, even compromise. Yeah, because following Jesus is really hard. And so the movement's leaders called apostles. They wrote letters to comfort and to challenge these communities to stay faithful to the difficult way of Jesus. And they're called to hope for the day when Jesus will come and change everything. And so the Bible ends by pointing to the future day when all wrongs are made right, when evil is eradicated, heaven and earth are united, and humanity can rule the world together in the love and power of God. Okay, so that's the story of the Bible, and it brings all of these books together. But what's interesting is that each book contains a different kind of literature that contributes to the story in a unique way, and that's what the next video will begin to explore. They're all free, they're all available online, particularly for, they're great, I watch them and I love them personally, but they're great, especially for those of you that have young ones at home, they're just great lessons and ways to, to understand, and I think they're, they're, you know, they're, they're engaging, and they're really well, well done in terms of not just the visually, but, but, but from a theological point of view as well. So let's talk about what the Bible is about as a whole. Um, we've looked at some of the narrative themes throughout it. Um, the book is not simply a comp compilation of a variety of stories from which we gain moral lessons. That's one of the mistakes so many people that call themselves Christians make. We think of the Bible as like this moral lesson book with a bunch of examples we can't live up to. Or some weird stories that don't seem to connect, but you know, there's some good stuff in there too that you can apply to your life. That's not what God gave us the Bible for. It's a story. It's the story of who he is, and I would put it this way, what the Bible is all about in one sentence. And there are lots of ways to craft this sentence, but this is one helpful way that I've found. And the story of how God creates, loves, pursues, redeems, and restores so that he can dwell with his people. Why did he create the world? Uh, for his glory and good purposes, but he also created man and woman in his image to do what? To be with him, to dwell with him. That's the central thing he's doing, wanting to dwell with his people. It comes up over and over again. Israel and the kingdom, right, to dwell with him. He even tells them, don't choose a human king. It will not go well, but they don't listen. We just don't <laughs> listen to God. And it doesn't. But the whole point is God wants to be for us, our everything, our king and our friend and our, our God to dwell with us. And we continually mess that up. So you could think of the Bible as what all that God does to dwell with his people in perfect relationship, which he will do, as, as Laura mentioned, at the return eventually. And the story is either moving to Jesus centered on Jesus or pointing back to Jesus, you know, or forward to him. Like it's all about him in terms of how God is going to dwell with us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, we're always going to talk to us about some, a couple, two of the major themes for how we see this desire for God to dwell with his people. Yeah, when we were talking about this, you could easily pick out, you know, 10 of these and we could spend a whole session on each one of them. So we narrowed it down to two, but it was difficult. Um, one of the major themes that we see throughout scripture is God's loving pursuit. So this is the pursuit of the offender by the offended. Um, this idea that God created us because he longs to dwell with us and we reject him, but he still comes after us, you know, and you see this theme over and over throughout uh, the history of the Bible and, and today, you know, mm -hmm. this idea that God is pursuing us um, and, and we keep turning away from him. We keep doing our own thing. Um, but you see it all the way through scripture, this idea that God longs to dwell with his people. Um, that was the idea that uh, Jeff gave even when they were wanting a king and God was saying, you don't need a king. I am your king. And they said, yeah, but you know, all the other countries seem to have one. It, it seems kind of cool to have a king. We'd like one for ourselves. And he said, this isn't going to go well. Um, but they, you know, still chose that. The whole temple imagery, first it was the tabernacle during the whole Exodus movement. You know, when they left Egypt, they're wandering through the desert, God gives them a tabernacle. And the tabernacle is sort of a portable temple um, where they would do their sacrifices, but it was also a place where God's presence would dwell among his people. And whenever they set up camp at night, um, 
all of the people would be on the outside, the temple would be in the middle. And the symbol of that is, or the tabernacle, that God is dwelling in the middle of his people. You could see it. It was you know, a visual aid for the people that that's God's house. He's living in the middle of us. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a pillar of cloud they followed by day and a pillar of fire they followed by night. And that's, again, a symbol of God leading them. And he's, he's leading them um, and he's with his people. Mm-hmm. So that's a theme you see all throughout scripture. Um, and then king and kingdom um, is the human longing for a true king. So I think this is, we long to have God dwell with us. So God longs to dwell with us, and we long to have him dwell with us. Uh, that's a desire that he's planted in our hearts. So um, we want a true king. We all have this sense that things aren't quite the way they were meant to be. Something's broken. Uh, We have this desire to be in relationship with something bigger than ourselves, the sense that something is in control over what feels like chaos to us. Um, And that's the desire to have God dwell with us, to have a sense that there's a purpose and a meaning to what's going on. Yeah, you see, this is so, if, if we just pay attention to human history and our culture, it's so evident about the human heart. We have this unhealthy tendency to attach our hopes and dreams and expectations to a person. Every political cycle we see this, don't we? This Messiah complex, this person, this agenda will, will fix the issues. Maybe not the most recent election, but you know, in general, this sort of thing. And you see it throughout history. This is why you, you see world dictators and leaders and you think, you look back in history, you go, how did people follow that? This longing to have somebody lead us right, you know? This is why we are so devastated when we see leaders in the political sphere and in churches, the culture of celebrity who fall into sin. We're fallen people. We have this desire to have somebody who would be right for us, lead us, and it never, it always goes wrong, always goes wrong. Mm. And this is part of God saying, I'm that for you. I'm the only one who can be that for you. And it's, it's all throughout the story of the scripture as well. And the God's loving pursuit, right? I mean, even in the garden, Adam and Eve sin, and what do they do? What are the first thing they do? You know the story? They hide. They cover up, right? (laughs) They hide from each other and from God. And God comes walking in the garden. My favorite part of the story. Adam, where are you? God is not confused about Adam's location. It's not like he misplaced his keys. Where did I put Adam? You know? He knows right where he is, but he's pursuing him, mm-hmm. calling him out of hiding, and that's all throughout the story. That happens over and over again. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, we're going to get now, um, um, briefly, and then we'll take a break, but into some of the, we're going to begin to talk about, now we understand, basics of the story. We could spend the whole session on the story, but we want to spend the bulk of our time on, okay, if that's the story, how do I read it and apply it to my life? How do I interpret this properly? Because that's, I think, perhaps the most helpful to you. Um, In John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, you see this text here, Jesus speaking here uh, to the the Pharisees. We heard about Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Well, don't they? Yes and no. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Can you see the incredible irony here? You're very religious. You study the scriptures. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. And you do, as long as you understand who they're talking about. There's not life in them unless you understand the one to whom they point. You only have eternal life in the scriptures that you study diligently if you get who they're talking about. And, and the Pharisees aren't the only ones that miss this. Our churches are full of people who miss the point. Who are morally upright, doing religious stuff, full of activity, even reading their Bible, but don't know Jesus. That's the whole, don't know Jesus. Maybe that's even you. Jesus, Jesus says, you study the scriptures and you don't understand that the whole point is me, who I am, what I've come to do. This is the tragedy of all people, not just the Pharisees, who are fixated on moral, moral law or biblical rules or morality, but they miss the person and message of Jesus. And this concept, by the way, um, We'll go to, go to the next one. The primary purpose of the scripture is a person, Jesus. This concept runs totally contrary to our, our, the way we're conditioned in our culture, doesn't it? You, don't think, you wouldn't say this out loud, but you are conditioned to think that you are the center of the universe. I'm guessing most of you wouldn't, don't walk around saying that, but we subconsciously think that about ourselves. You're the center of your social media world, right? How many likes, how many followers, who's responding to what I'm posting? And we view our life this way. How's my life going? And when we come to the Bible, it's almost like we can't help but read ourselves into it as the center of it. And that's 
That's the mistake number one. If you get nothing else out of tonight and you walk away out of here going, okay, so I'm not the center of the Bible, that'd be pretty good. <laughs> You're not. Newsflash. You're not the hero of the story. You're not the center of the Bible. This might sound obvious, but you are. It's social media, Hollywood, romance novels, Hallmark movies, women, ladies, and guys who like them. Hallmark movies, they're made to make, put you at the center. Which one am I? Am I that guy? Am I the girl that she doesn't, I'm not, you know, we just put ourselves in the center of every story, <laughs> right? Now, you're in the Bible. It has things to say to your life, but you're not the point. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, Steve. No, right? <laughs> in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, what was that Carly Simon song that, that she sang? Well, you, you're so vain, right? You probably think this book is about you, don't you, don't you. Don't you. So uh, if you don't know that song, that's probably good. Ask your parents. Right? Okay, so we all tend to read the Bible as subconsciously as if it's about us, uh, our own expectations, desires to become the grid through which we read Scripture. There's actually a story of Jesus in the New Testament, which is a great illustration of this point, because we're not the only ones to do this. Uh, Luke, Luke 24. You have your Bible with you? Um, ooh, we could probably no, wait to that. We're going to wait, right? Yes. Luke 24. Uh, I'm going to read the whole story for you. Only p- part of it's on the screen now, but I'm going to read the whole story. Uh, th- well, actually, verses 13 through 32. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. This is after the resurrection, by the way. About seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in in these days? And he said to them, what things? Jesus is just having fun now. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, which is a reference to the Tanakh, we learned that last week, the Old Testament, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If you like to highlight or underline, you should underline verse 27. That's key. So they drew near to the village to where they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. Jesus is so cool. <laughs> And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? This is an amazing story, and it's extremely relevant for your study of the Bible. There's a lot to say to us. So Cleopas and his friend are called disciples. That means followers, not not the 12, but they're followers of Jesus, meaning they, they were around him. They heard his teaching. They were with him. These aren't strangers. These aren't peripheral guys. And this is after the resurrection, and they're walking, and they're, dis- they're downcast and dejected, and Jesus walks up and goes, what are you guys talking about? You know? And then they say, we, why are you so sad? And what is their answer? Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What do you see there? What is their hope? That Jesus would redeem Israel, but he does. What are they saying? Their hope is what? Political redemption, Mm. military conquest, David's throne restored. In other words, they have a specific expectation, a specific lens, a specific way of reading the Bible in the Old Testament, and and Jesus did not meet their expectation, and now they're destroyed. They're looking into the scriptures for a, a particular thing. We had hoped it would go this way, and it hasn't. Therefore, I don't know. In other words, I think right there in verse 21, we get a lesson about how we misread the Bible. 
We read our own expectations. You read your own hopes into it. You read your own lens. I do the same thing. God ought to bless me this way because I'm a good person. But we read our expectations into the Bible, and then it doesn't go the way we think it should go. And we think, we don't think, something must be wrong with my lens. We think, well, God must not be, his word must not, not be true. And then what is verse 27? Jesus in verse 27 gives us a hermeneutical principle. Hermeneutics is the fancy word for interpret, the science of interpretation. It's how we're supposed to interpret the Bible. What's the primary principle he gives us? This is, you could just say this word and be right in church. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus. Just say Jesus, right? His, his principle of interpretation, the fundamental principle of interpretation of the Bible is himself. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, which is a way of referring to all the scriptures, he shows them how it all points to him. Wouldn't you have loved to have been on that walk with Cleopas and his friend? <laughs> have Jesus talked to, okay, look, at, this is how it points to me. This is how it points to me. This is how I fulfilled this. So when you read the Bible, the first thing you should be doing is not asking, how does this apply to my life? What can I get out of this? How does this inspire me? Those are good questions to ask, but they're not first. We'll get to this later. Yeah. The question you ought to be asking is, what does this teach me about who God is and then the character and nature of Christ? How does this point me to Jesus? That's, that's foundational to a good Bible study. Jesus opens their eyes as they walk along the road together. Okay, so uh, Edmund Clowney has this great quote. He's got a hilarious name, but a great quote. <laughs> the central affirmation of the New Testament writers is that the preexistent Jesus was present throughout Israel's history and indeed from before the beginning of the biblical narrative. We, we tend to think, and I'm, I'm guessing some of you think that, well, you know, okay, the Old Testament's weird. There's like a donkey that talks and an axe head that floats and the Red Sea parts, and I don't understand it all. But then Jesus kind of makes sense, and I get him. He comes on later. But the story has always been about who God is and what he's going, going to do in Christ. And that's really, really important when you come to study whatever part, an Old or New Testament. Well, um, so when you read the great biblical figures, when you read the stories of Moses and Aaron and Ruth and Esther, the temptation is to make them examples to follow. How many of you think mm -hmm. that way? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to be like them. I want to follow their example. There are lessons to follow, but that's not the first question you should be asking. The first question you should be asking is, what does this reveal to me about God, and how does this point me to Christ? If you get that much, again, this, these, these are really good, important, foundational um, lessons for us. Now, we have one more video to show you. Mm -hmm. This is a fun video. Before, uh, before yeah, we go oh, to sorry. that... Um, Did I skip something? No, Shoot. not at all. We're going to show you the video, but then we're going to go to break. So I was just oh, going to yeah, yeah, yeah. let you guys know, we have Bibles on this stage. If any of you don't already own a modern translation of Scripture, we brought some for you. So there's some NIV and some NLT. Just see us at the break, and we'd love to hook you up they're with free, one They're of those. free, they're free. Now, if and you then, have 10 Bibles, don't come up here and take one of those. <laughs> Leave it for somebody else. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you is out at the welcome desk, we have a bunch of handouts. There's a few that uh, we went through really fast last week, so we brought some extra copies of those. There's some new stuff out there too, but I also wanted to tell you these books are out there. They're free again, so feel free to grab one. You can do all that at the break. Um, so we'll show you this video. Yeah, well, uh, back to the Bibles for a minute. Yeah. This is, this is, we really do want you to know this. If maybe you have like a, a translation that's hard for you to read or it's a family Bible, you don't, but if you don't have your own modern translation with good study notes, we bought these and we want to give them to you as our gift. So feel free to come get one. No shame in that. I'm just saying some of you who are like book collectors like me and you have 10 Bibles, don't, don't come take one of these. All right? <laughs> okay, let's okay. watch. This is a great story. You'll love this. Here's what you need to do. You've got to first shave your head. You dress all in black. You've got to wear a white robe, eat only kosher foods. You've got to become a vegetarian. You face Jerusalem. You've got to face India when you pray. You pray only in Hebrew, and you grow a nice big beard. And if you do all of those outward cultural things, you'll discover the God of the universe. And I'm thinking this is crazy that someone thinks that they can force their culture on God and that God's going to be impressed by what you wear, what direction you face when you pray, what you eat, and all these sorts of things. It seemed to me that if there was a God out there who could be known, he should be able to be recognized no matter where I face, no matter how I'm dressed, because he's God. Growing up, uh, we always understood that we had our Bible and the Gentiles had their Bible in the New Testament and that they were two completely separate books. 
because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic, I imagined that Jesus was Italian. And so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see, and yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not a person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible. When I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father um, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults. And he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months. And uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city in New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was, the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over, I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand. He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. Am I on? Yeah, good. I just love that story. Uh, we, it, it, for many reasons. One, the story of a man and his father coming to faith. Uh, and, and, and even that, in reference to Isaiah 53, it's sometimes referred to as the forbidden chapter because so few Jews read it and understand who it's talking about. It's the suffering servant, but the Messiah. But, but you hear how much he talked about how Jesus was not a renegade, but the promised one. How everything fit together, how he was compelled by him. And I just thought that was a good illustration of what we were just talking about. Jesus walking with these disciples saying, you can't read the scriptures and not understand that they're about me. If you do, they're, they're of no value to you. They're just another religious book that has some interesting stories, some wacky stuff, and some inspirational quotes. But, but in him, they hold together.
So we're going to take a break. If you have questions, be thinking about those. We'll have time at the end of the next session to, to do some Q&A. We're going to take a break to get some cookies. I did not eat all the cookies last time. I don't know where that rumor came from, <laughs> but we have plenty. Carrot sticks and chocolate muffins, come on back. <laughs> come on back. Come on, James. I see you out there. <laughs> I don't know, is my voice in the lobby or not? Come back. Come back, everyone. We're not done. Put away the snacks. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives the Beatitudes, the Blesseds. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you shall be filled. So I think it's very, you're very blessed, those of you that wanted the Bible so much you took them all. <laughs> That's fantastic. And you can sign up, or if you want to know what those, tra- they're, they're easy to get on Amazon as well. Those aren't mm-hmm. hard to find. Come on back in. All right. It's me, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, we're going to begin by talking about specifically how you should approach the Bible when you read it and basic principles of interpretation. Um, so like the specifics of it. When you sit down to read your Bible, how do you approach it? What should you be thinking? What are the questions you should be asking? How do you take notes on it? All that kind of thing. So let's talk about posture, not my wife and my mom always said I have bad posture. I don't mean that. I mean your approach, your, 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 the posture of your heart and mind when you come to the Bible. So three, three things. First is be humble. Um, a genuine desire to be instructed by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. That's really important. Humility means when you come to read God's Word, you're, you're, you're coming saying, I want to be taught. I want to learn. I'm acknowledging that I don't have all that I need and I want God to speak to me. It's a position of humility. John Newton, the great hymn writer, who was himself a slave trader, wrote to him amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, right? Here's one of the things he says about reading the Bible. I desire to submit both my sentiments and my practices to be controlled and directed by what I read in Scripture. Without this, my reading and searching will only issue in greater confusion and condemnation, bringing me under the heavy doom of that servant who knew his master's will but did it not. Isn't that good? He says, I want to bring both my sentiment, my feelings, and my practice, my actions, all of me, underneath the authority of God's word, a posture of humility. If you come to your Bible for self-justification or confirmation bias, you fail before you started. That's a hard thing. We talk about our expectations and our hopes. Sometimes we don't even know the, the filters that we, so some of the hard work is to, is to come as open as you can, lay in aside preconceived notions, and, and humble enough to say, God, speak to me and teach me. In 2 Timothy 3.16, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, his younger brother in the faith, he says, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for daily tweets. doesn't say that, right? Little nuggets to inspire. It's useful for teaching, correcting, and reproving, meaning it's ch- it should change you. It should challenge you. If, if your reading of the Bible doesn't shake you up and go, I, oh, whoa, this is hard, this is challenging, then you're probably not reading it right or at all. A simple prayer I pray. It's written on the inside cover of my Bible, and I pray it when I, I try to remember to pray it every time I read. I don't always, I'll confess, but I, I want to. And the prayer simply is, Lord, open your word to me and open me to your word. Here's what that means. Open your word to me, meaning I can't know it unless you're going to reveal it to me. I'm not smart enough to just get it all, right? So I need you to open it to me that I might see wonderful things about you and your word. And open me to your word, meaning there's stuff in, that are barriers in my heart that, I w- that would prevent me from hearing what you want to say. So open us both, in other words. And that's been helpful. Second, persistence. Be persistent. I talk to people and frequently hear people say things like, I tried to read the Bible, but it didn't work for me, or I didn't find anything, I wasn't inspired. What they generally mean by that is, I read a couple verses, and it didn't fix my immediate issue, so I put it aside. Right? Stay with it. In fact, um, in John 5, 39, we just looked at it a few minutes ago, right? Jesus says, you diligently search the scriptures. The phrase diligently search is borrowed from a Greek terminology for mining. It literally means to, uh, to dig and examine. Isn't that what miners do? They dig 
and they examine. They dig some more and they sift through it, they examine. They dig some more and they sift through and they examine. That's what he, Jesus is saying we do when we come to the word of God. Stay with it, stay persistent. Um, let me give you an example from C.S. Lewis and his uh, book in the Narnian Chronicles, The Silver Chair. This is a, a, it's not my favorite story of his, but it's up there. So Jill Pohl is, um, is um, one of the four Pevensey children, and um, the lion, um, no, she's not Susan, Jill Pohl's different. Susan's one of the four, uh, Jill, Susan and Lucy. Jill Pohl is, in, is, is, part, is the sibling of Eustace, but never mind about that. So the lion gives Jill four, uh, these four signs. Lion Aslan gives Jill Pohl four signs by which she's to watch for his work and this is how they're going to find the prince and restore him to his throne. And he tells her the four signs and says, repeat them back to me. And she gets him kind of wrong. Says them again and repeat it back to me. And she gets him a little bit better. And he says, keep repeating those signs to yourself. You're going to need to recognize them and remember them and lead the others. And you can guess where this goes. Even though she knows the signs by heart and she was repeating them, she stops repeating them every night. And they miss the first sign. Then they miss the second sign. Then they miss the third sign. And eventually Jill says, oh, it's all my fault. And everything's become horrid because I stop repeating these every night. I don't know for sure that's what Lewis intended, but I think he's doing, among other things, great storytelling. He's sneaking in there. He, Lewis says, fairy tales and stories help us get us past the watchful dragons of adults. What he means by that is we all have our like, preconceived barriers, and stories kind of sneak in truths behind those things. And I think what he's saying here is, stay in the Word. Repeat it to yourself. Meditate on it. Chew on it. Be persistent. Stay with it. And it, it's not a one-time thing. It's not a flip through and, oh, this didn't inspire me, so I'm done. That's not how you read the Bible. Okay. Uh, then, then the last one is expect, be expected. When you come to God's word, this, uh, when you um, have a conversation with a good friend, what are your expectations? What, what do you expect when you call or get together with a very trusted friend? What do you expect? Seriously, you can answer this out loud. Honesty. You expect a response, right? What else? Connection, them to listen, you want to be heard, you want them to give you sound advice. So you, there's expectations you have, right? When you come to the word of God, what do you expect? What are your expectations? Really, I mean it. Well, confusion and guilt, right? <laughs> Some of us. I think when we come to the word of God, be reminded this is the God who longs to what? What's the central story of the Bible? He longs to dwell with his people. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. He does that through the Holy Spirit and inside, certainly. But the primary way God has spoken to us is in his son and in his word. This is, God wants to speak to you through the telling of his story. And so I think we should have the expectation that we will hear from him. Um, okay. The, oh, I, the, as far as these quotes go, we'll go through these quickly. I, I love quotes. Um, and so I shared some with you. That's about all there is to say about that. <laughs> no, no. But I love this one from Abraham Lincoln, which you might not expect. I am profitably engaged in reading the Bible. Take all of this book that you can by reason and take the balance by faith. I love that line. And you will live and die a better man. This is the best book which God has given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. That's a remarkable quote from Abraham Lincoln. D.L. Moody, Dwight Lyman Moody, founder of Moody Bible Institute and Moody Church. The Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. That's a foundational truth. You read the Bible not to know more stuff. That's not the goal. The goal is not to have lots of quotes and, and, and sound smart. The goal is to know God and be transformed in knowing him. That's what he gave you his word for. Not so you could be a Bible nerd. I mean, Bible nerds are cool. I like them. Laura is one. Yeah. But, you for know. sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next. J.I. Packer. The, the prime, you notice that like really smart people have two initials for a first name? <laughs> C.S. Lewis, J.I. Packer, uh, D.L. Moody. The primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but to know God. And he wrote a book called Knowing God on that very, which is a fantastic mm -hmm. book if you've never read it. Frederick Buechner. This is Brian Coffey's favorite author. Not as good as Lewis, but you know, you've got to have your favorite. Um, he writes, the Bible is not a text we must master. It is a text that must master us. I love that. You know, you go to school and you get a subject, you're supposed to become the, you get a master's degree, right? Or a doctor's degree, and you're sort of conditioned, like, the book is the, is the text I master. I become an expert of it. That's not the goal with the Bible. I don't sit over the Bible. The Bible's over me, right? I come under its teaching. It masters my heart and my mind and my soul. I don't master it. 
And then last, this one from R.A. Torrey. Again, initials. I should go by J.J. Frazier. But J.J. sounds like a little kid, so I don't like that. <laughs> it is clear that there must be difficulties for us in a revelation such as the Bible. If someone were to hand me a book that was as simple to me as the multiplication table and say, this is the word of God, in it he has revealed his whole will and wisdom, I would shake my head and say, I cannot believe it. That is too easy to be a perfect revelation of infinite wisdom. There must be in any complete revelation of God's mind and will and character and being things hard for the beginner to understand. And the wisest and best of us are but beginners. Isn't that great? In other words, he's saying well, you should expect difficulties. This is God we're talking about. It's not a fairy tale that all makes sense perfectly in the end. There's clarity in the truth of Scripture, but there's also mystery and challenge and difficulties to wrestle through. Another quote that's listed for you there by a man named Thomas Merton, who was a monk, a hermit, actually said, if you find God easy to, always easy to understand, and you're reading the Bible, perhaps it's not God that you found, but a God of your own making. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to pass it to Laura, and now we'll talk some more specifics. Um, it's interesting, I was having a talk with somebody in the office this week, and we were talking about how when you come to read scripture, when you've been reading it for a long time, and you've been studying it for a long time, and you start in a new section, how it all seems new again. Um, if you've been spending, you know, a big chunk of time reading the Old Testament, and you go to the New Testament, you're like, wow, I'm, you know, it's been so long since I've read this, this is amazing. Um, so the Bible never gets old, there's always new stuff to learn, um, new stuff to get excited about, so that's super fun. So we're going to talk about basics of Bible study. So when you open the Bible to a chapter and you're going to read it, um, what in the world do you do? What's the first step? So we want to go through these things. And I should say the very first step always mm -hmm. is to begin with prayer, mm -hmm. um, to ask God to teach you something. And this is a prayer that God loves to answer. It's one of those prayers that's a little dangerous because you never know what God's going to do with it. But he loves, I mean, the goal of the Bible is um, it's God's word to us. He wants us to know him. He's given us his word um, so that we can know his heart. So if we pray to him and ask him to tell us his heart, he is falling all over himself in eagerness to do that, to answer that prayer. So begin with prayer. Ask God to reveal something new to you, um, something you can use, something that teaches you more about him. Okay, then the next step is observation. So when you read the scripture, read through a good chunk of it, um, and then begin asking yourself some observation questions. So this is who, what, when, where, um, you know, your basic trying to figure out what's happening in this text. Uh, who are the main characters? Who is the author? Who are they writing to? What are they writing about? What's the action that's happening? Or what's the main point of the story? Um, those kinds of questions. Those are observation questions. Um, it's good to remember what type of literature you're reading, um, where you are in the whole Bible story. Remember, we had those 12 people standing up here with their little sections. So it's good to know, like, oh, I'm reading about, you know, the story of the Exodus, or I'm reading about, you know, the story of the exile, or I'm learning about Jesus, or this section is coming out of the church age. So it's good to have an idea of where you are in the whole story because it just kind of gives you a reference point. Um, so the first level is observation. What does the text say? And you should find the answers on the page. It should be pretty direct. Okay, then the next step is interpretation. So now we're getting into more of the meaning. Um, so this is the why and how, and finally, what does it teach me about God? And Jeff was saying to us that all of the Bible is about God. It all points back to Jesus. Um, so that, you know, whatever you're reading, there should always be something about God that you're learning. God's heart for the world, um, you know, God's pursuit of us, those kinds of things should always come through. So the why and how, um, things like why was it written? Uh, what was the point? What was the author's hope in writing this text? Um, what is the central meaning of this text? You know, again, if, as much as possible to read through scripture and say, okay, why is this here? Um, how should I think differently because of this passage? So those are the kinds of interpretive questions you should be asking yourself. And I would strongly encourage you to even get a notebook and write down some of those questions. And as you're reading through, just to write some of those answers out. And you'd be amazed at how much you learn um, when you begin asking questions of the text and writing them down. It's fun to go back, 
years later and look at the different layers of meaning you pulled out at different points in your life. And I mm -hmm. think part of that's because we change. So the questions mm -hmm. we bring to the text changes and the things that we notice change and how we think about them in uh, the context of our own lives change. That, that's a good point. How many of you have ever read the Bible and you read a passage you know you've read before, but for some reason it just comes alive to you in a new way? Ever that happened to you, anybody? Mm -hmm. What, why is that? The Bible didn't, the words were there. The same words, right? Lord has said it, right? God's word is always there, but we've changed. You're asking different questions based on life experience. Maybe you've been through some pain or some disappointment or some grief mm -hmm. or some, uh, whatever it is, and your, your heart is open in a way it wasn't before. That's why like, you keep reading it mm -hmm. and keep reading it because always, there's always more. Like, don't you love to watch the best movies over and over again <laughs> and talk about them? Why? Don't you want to read the good stories again? C.S. Lewis said, any book that's only worth reading once is not worth reading at all. <laughs> we want to hear, tell the same story. This is true with just human literature. Yeah. When it comes to God's story, we want to stay in it because there's always more. All right, sorry, Laura. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I, I find as I get older, the things that I notice in the stories are very different. Mm -hmm. um, you go back and read like the story of Ruth. Like when I was really young, I read Ruth and I thought, oh, this is you know great love story about you know Ruth. And now I read it and I think she was a refugee. She was a mm -hmm. foreigner. Like she was mm -hmm. in desperate need. So I just I notice different things because I've gotten older. Okay, application. So um, this is when we start to think. Okay, I, I've observed the text. I've tried to figure out what it meant. Um, and I've asked the why and the how questions. I've tried to figure out sort of the main thrust of the passage. Now, what am I going to do with this piece of information? So this is the application. So where am I in this story? So as you're reading, um, especially the narrative sections, um, to think who, which character do I most identify with in this moment? Um, am I like Pharaoh? Do, you know, do I have a hard heart that needs to be softened? Do I need to listen to something that God's trying to tell me? Or am I more like Moses taking a risk and doing something really hard that seems really terrifying, but I'm mm -hmm. doing it because I feel like God's asked me to do it? Um, am I like the Israelites, terrified of what comes next, but being willing to follow? So, you know, different points in our lives, we may identify with different characters, but to think about where am I in this story? Um, what can I identify with? And then commands to obey. Is there something in this text that I'm reading that I need to apply to my life right now? Uh, what is God telling me? And does it involve a change of direction for me? Um, am I thinking differently about things because of what I've encountered in Scripture? And if so, mm -hmm. I need to make adjustments sooner rather than later. Um, promises to trust. Is there something in here that I'm learning um, that God wants me to believe on faith? Mm -hmm. Is he challenging me in a new way to grow um, and to, to take risks and to live differently um, because of his promises? And then again, actions to take. Are there ways that I should be shifting my life? And my mom, who is the fount of all wisdom, um, told me <laughs> that part of spiritual- Not the Holy Spirit, apparently. But she's close. Um, she said spiritual maturity is learning how to shorten the distance of time between God revealing something and you putting it into practice. Mm, that's good. So the more spiritually mature you are, the quicker God gets your attention, the quicker you put it into practice. Mm -hmm. So I, when we're younger, sometimes God has to keep persisting and saying, you need to change this, you need to change this, and we drag our feet and take our time. Yeah, that never happens when we're older. <laughs> but the longer you know God, you know, you know you're going to follow him mm -hmm. sooner or later. It's better to do I it like sooner. Um, so yeah. what actions can I take? And I would encourage you, as you begin reading scripture, to have an ear for that. Um, what is the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. nudging me? What direction am I being challenged? Um, and, and to almost test God what does it look like if I um, break with this old pattern? What if I try doing it God's way um, and see what happens, see what he does? So before we, we're going to give you some specifics now about some of the passages that are maybe ways, of, some exercises in misreading that will hopefully illustrate how you should read. But uh, let's just review this for a minute. This is really important because if you look at this last slide that was on right here, I think so many people begin with that last bullet point. What should I do? How many of you have been in a, a group when you read the Bible or something about the Bible, and the first question I ask is, well, what do you think it means? <laughs> well, I think, and we're just pulling our ignorance, right? <laughs> well, I think, well, I think, well, my grandma, my mom always said, no offense <laughs> to your mom, but we, we just start saying, your mom was wise, but you know, we just start saying stuff. We have it, so, and I think that's where people get off track. 
That's where you get wacky views. And like, you know, I talk to people, I go, you got that from reading God's word? So the, the order is very important. Hold off on that. Something in us wants to, even in our tweetable culture, we want to go right for the nugget, right? Right for the thing that I could, they could hold on to and do. Hold off on that. Begin, and this, I hope you saw, this takes time. Mm. You can't do this in a hurry. Right. Set aside some time a couple times a week. Daily if you have the time, but a couple times a week. Laura mentioned this in passing, but it's really a good practice. Have a little notebook next to you mm -hmm. and say, just read a chunk of, the, of scripture and say, okay, I'm going to observe. Who wrote this? If you have one of the Bibles we suggested or a study Bible, often in the beginning of every book of the Bible, it tells you who the author is and the date of writing. And so just jot a, little, jot a little note down. Who are they writing to? What period of world history was this written in? You, can, you don't have to be a, a, a scholar to figure this stuff out. It's mm -hmm. readily available to you, right? Just start observing what's happening here in this story before I ever get to me. Make it obs the obvious observations. You know, ask the obvious things first. And then Laura mentioned interpretation. Right, then begin to say, what was the primary message? One of the ways I try to do that before I preach something is I try to restate the main point of a passage in my own words, and I write it out in my little, my little notebook. I try to say, okay, if I was going to rewrite, not that I'm, we shouldn't rewrite the Bible, but it's helpful for me right, to say, okay, what's the main thrust that Paul or Peter or whoever is trying to get across here? And I try to write it out in my own words. And then I look at it, go, mm, maybe not, and I craft it, work at it, because I want to have that like, laser focus on that before I get up and talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's a good practice for you just in your study. What's the main point here? How would I restate that? It's really helpful. That's the interpretation side, right? Then we get to, like the funnel. Mm -hmm. Now we get down to, what does it say to me? That's what Laura did a really good job explaining to us. But this is so foundational and important, and we start backwards. And if you start with actions to take or promises to trust, you'll never get to the other things. And you'll never really understand the scope and the sweep of the story. You'll miss the really good stuff. Okay. And I'll say too, the Bible Project, we've shown you a couple of their videos, um, the animated videos that today we looked at the storyline of the Bible. That's a great idea. They great also idea. have, for each book of the Bible, they have an introductory video that tells you all of these things in that animated form. That's so it tells brilliant. you, That's yeah, brilliant. You should just author. do that. If you don't like to read a lot or do, you don't have mm -hmm. much, much time, watch the video. You're, if you're like distracted at ADD like me, watch the video. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, there's yeah. some really good stuff there. Okay, so we're going to take a couple passages of scriptures that we've noticed that are very commonly uh, misinterpreted by doing what Lord has taught us the wrong way. This is the one you see on every graduation card that's Christian ever, right? <laughs> for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Let's read it together, shall we? <laughs> for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I like that prosperity and no harm, a good future. It says it right there in the Bible. God wants to make me prosperous and no harm will come to me. I'm going to be safe and rich. It says it right there. Right? That's, I mean, you're laughing because I'm trying to be over the top of this, but that's how people read this and they put it on graduation cards for people graduating high school. God's going to give you a great plan, meaning a prosperity. I'll get a good job. I'll get good grades. I'll get a good girlfriend, you know, whatever. And no harm will come to me. That, friends, is not what it's saying. The context of this story comes from the prophet Jeremiah. You can figure that out from the screen. Jeremiah is known as, who knows what his nickname was? The weeping, weeping prophet. prophet. Yeah. He was very emotional. No, right? no. What's he weeping over? The sin and rebellion and the cost of the sin to God's people Israel. Mm -hmm. In this story, where Jeremiah 29, we won't go into too much detail for the sake of time tonight, but if you go back and read the story, this is, uh, Marcio is asking about captivity and exile, where, where, there he is. So this is in that period, they're, they're captive people in exile, and there's a false prophecy circling around, somebody's saying, next year is the year God's going to deliver you. In one year, God will set you free. And Jeremiah says... Actually, no. <laughs> it's going to take 70 more years. Now, God will deliver you. He has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. But most of you will die before you see that. 70 more years. And then he'll bring you out. Your children and grandchildren will see his hand. That's the context in which he says, I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you but yet some of you will die in captivity. 
to give you hope and a future, meaning you as my people as a whole, not you individually to make you successful and wealthy and no harm come to you personally right now. You see how screwed up we get with this? And we put it on graduation cards and say, you're gonna have a great life, it says so. You know? <laughs> it's a, it's a, because why? Because you take that one verse and you jump right to promises to claim. Mm-hmm. But you haven't done what? Observation. Who wrote this? When did they write it? What was going on? Mm-hmm. What was their primary message, right? You see how you miss it? This happens all the time. This is just an obvious example. Laura's got more. <laughs> no, you have more. You're doing Isaiah. <laughs> oh, I am. I'm doing, yeah. I, have, I have more. This is you. Okay, this is another one that just kills me. <laughs> How many of you ever heard this one, right? For, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. You've heard this before. Show of hands if you've ever heard this or something like it. How do most people use this? Well... God's ways are higher, <laughs> meaning I don't know. <laughs> it makes no sense to me, but his ways are higher. Like, it is sort of like this weird way of saying kind of whatever. It is what it is almost. Like a Christian way of saying it is what it is. God's ways are higher, and who can understand him? We just kind of go through life, right? <laughs> now, let's go to this, the, the actual text in which this is said, because this is really actually very beautiful, and it's really a tragedy we miss out on what's being said here. Isaiah 55. Isaiah has the, some of the greatest messianic prophecies, the most of them, and some of the most beautiful. But um, in 55, he's talking specifically about something about God's character. So this is verses 8 and 9. Let's back up and read from 1 to 7. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food, incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know shall run to you. Because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for for he has glorified you. Amazing promise, right? Come to me for real food and real nourishment and real love. Then verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. Does it sound different now? He says, let the wicked man forsake his way. Let those who are sinful and rebellious return. God will abundantly pardon. For his ways are not like yours. In, in what ways are God's ways not like our ways? Just mysterious and who can know him? Specifically in the fact that he pardons people who he has every right to punish. That's how he's not like us. Do you hold grudges? Do you say you forgive people, but in your heart you go, mm, uh, uh, uh. you know, like, God's not like you. His ways are so much higher than our ways. He forgives freely when you return to him. He's profoundly unlike you because he pardons and he forgives when we run to him. Isn't that beautiful? But we make this out to be some way of just talking about who can know God. I don't know. <laughs> no, you can know God. And specifically, it's not about how you can't know God. It's about how beautifully you can know him, even though he's not like you. His forgiveness and his mercy and his love are knowable, even though they're nothing like you get in human relationships. Mm. Isn't that awesome? I think it's awesome. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right. We're going to do Philippians 4.13. Oh, on every athlete's shoe. Yes. (laughs) This is totally, Yes victorious athlete. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So this is sort of the, we're going to get this done. This is like a classic <laughs> mission trip. Like, come on guys, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Um, that's not how Paul meant it. So this is Paul writing to the Philippians, thanking them for a financial gift they sent him because they heard he was in need. And he said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Mm -hmm. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So (laughs) do you see the little different spin here? He's not saying, come on, guys, we can do this. He's saying, you know, if circumstances are hard or if things are relatively easy, God is the one who gives me strength. And he's saying, I've learned what it is to be content in every situation. And this is Paul who's been shipwrecked and you know, arrested and beaten. He's faced all kinds of hardships for the sake of the gospel. And he's saying, regardless of my circumstances, yeah. I know what it is to trust in Christ. And he says, it's Christ who gives me strength. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's where he draws from his reserves um, because he trusts him regardless of mm. you know, the momentary circumstances that he's facing. So what are the all things in that context? We read that and think all things, all the things that I would decide I want to do. <laughs> but what are the all things? The Lord just said it, mm-hmm. right? Endure, mm-hmm. suffer, trust, patience. Stuff I couldn't do without the strength of Christ. Not, I can score 45 points and beat the Celtics or whatever. <laughs> like, you know, if that, which I couldn't do anyway. But you know. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And this is sort of similar, but it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So the common way of interpreting this is God will never give you anything too hard for you to handle. Um, Jeff and I were talking about this the week, and we were like, this is crazy. God always gives us things that are too hard for us to handle, right? I mean, How many of you heard that saying? God will never give you more than you can handle. Who's heard that? That's yeah. not in the Bible. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. It's not a verse. It's not a principle. It's not in here. If someone tells you that, you should say, you need to read the Bible. Come to this class with me. It doesn't say that. In fact, the whole point is life is more than you can handle yes. without God. Right. So but, this, and it's, ta- it's a misunderstanding of this text. Right. It's the same idea, right? Like you are going to face hard things and that's going to push you to trust in God and to, to trust him to carry you through those you know, intense trials. But it doesn't mean we're not going to face trials. We absolutely will. Specifically though, what is this text take- talking about? So this one is talking what? about... <laughs> <laughs> Keep setting me up here. This is about no, I'm, I'm to them. Sorry. specific Sorry. trials and temptations that the Israelites have faced and, you know, ways that they failed and the ways that God, you know, rescued them out of that. So I'm going to go back here, but um, starting in verse six, it says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of the as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. So you see here, there's a problem. Some of the people are rebelling and they're facing difficulty as a result. And it says, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You ever heard the phrase, the devil made me do it? Well, yeah. what, the, what the text is teaching us is that you, temptation is common to us all, but you don't have to sin. Right. There's a way out. There's a way out to trust God and not give in to whatever that temptation is. That's what it's saying. Mm-hmm. Not God will never give you more than you can handle, but when temptation comes, which is common, you're going to have it. You don't have to sin. You're not bound to sin if you're in Christ. There's a way out. So there, in, in the sense, there's nothing too hard for us to handle in the sense that God is going to always care for us. When we are tempted, we don't have mm-hmm. to give in to temptation. Um, God wants to support us through that. The, I th- the, these are just to illustrate for you how, how it's so common, even inside the Christian subculture, to get things wrong because we don't read the Bible right. We don't read like, okay, what is, who's talking here? Where does this fit, as Laura said, in the whole story? And what was their intent for the original audience? Mm-hmm. 
And when we do that work, then you come down and then you're, you're much more, you're better positioned to understand what it means for you. Not every promise made to Israel is meant to be directly made to you. Same way we just saw in Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Mm-hmm. Not every promise is a direct, specific one you can apply to your life. There are principles you certainly can, and some promises are, but you're never going to know the difference if you, don't do the, if you don't start the way she described it for us. And you can get yourself in a lot of trouble if you don't take the time to read Scripture carefully. And I, I want to be careful here. It's, it's not like um, I don't ever, we don't ever get, I've read Scripture passages before and made mistakes in interpretation, and I... I talk with other believers, I read commentaries, we, Laura and mm-hmm. I and others discuss, and so it's not like, um, I don't want, if you're feeling like, well, I can never get this right, that's part of the journey, is struggling to understand, having, one of the best things you could do is read something and go, I don't understand this, and then call somebody who loves Jesus and say, let's talk about this. How great would that be? Well, this is why it's so helpful to read scripture in community with others in a small group or a Bible study, because you're going to get lots of different voices. Um, and, and between all of that, you'll get closer, I mm-hmm. think, to the, the meaning of the text. Okay, so how to read the big story of the Bible. So we started out tonight by having those 12 people stand up here with the 12 signs that gave us sort of the storyline of the whole Bible. Um, And where should you start? Like if you go home, you've got a new Bible and you open it up, where do you begin? Um, So Brian Coffey's book, the one that we have out there, um, on pages 136 through 139 of his book, and I've got all this information up on the screen and it's in your handout, but he does this great thing where he says, well, first we'll summarize the Bible in one verse, which is John 3.16, which is, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I was joking with my kids today because I memorized that in the King James when I was little, and it's really hard for me to say it in normal English and not do the whosoever believeth. Yeah. Me thinks. I really have to think about it hard. Um, but John 3.16 is a great verse to memorize because it sort of does summarize the whole message of the Bible, that idea that God longs to dwell with his people and the cost that he paid so he could, which is the story mm-hmm. of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if you want to read one chapter, Brian Coffey gives us these uh, few chapters of the Bible to read. So Romans 5, Hebrews 10, Isaiah 53 or Psalm 51. Any one of those would be so if you great. want to read one chapter, read four chapters? Well, pick one. <laughs> so, okay. And then read another one. And then read another one. Um, right. And then if you want to get a sense of, um, in one book, start with the Gospel of John. And then he has the whole Bible in condensed form. So you can see, you kind of start small and get, work your way outwards. And he was saying, it's, he was trying to think of like a Cliff Notes version of the Bible. So this condensed form takes you through the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament and gives you a taste of sort of each of these different periods of the story that we've been talking about tonight. Far be it for me to disagree with Pastor Brian. No, no, no. Actually, this is very, I think this is very helpful. Uh, but it is funny, though, when you think about a Cliff Notes version of the Bible, because most of us think... This is such a thick book, right? You, you ever thought that? Like, there's a lot in there. Actually, you know what it says in, in John's gospel? The end of John's gospel, uh, John says, if all that Jesus said and did were to be written down, there wouldn't be enough books and libraries of the world to contain it all. So that's just what Jesus said and did. So actually, we got a pretty thin cross-section of what God could have given us. Which would, so I would just encourage you, this is a great way to start, yeah. but don't stop there. Yeah. Read the whole thing. Well, absolutely. We're going to give you guys a lot of different ways. So I'm going to go back here. Um, We gave you that. Then also out at the table, there was a little handout, the devotional reading plan that kind of takes you through. It's a couple months worth of reading. Same idea, just a a chapter or two a day. Um, We just wanted to give you lots of different options or overviews of how to do this. Um, So these are ways you can do this on your own. You can follow Brian Coffey's plan. You can read the devotional... Bible reading plan. Um, another thing on the YouVersion app, we talked about this last week, but it's Y-O-U version. Um, it's the Bible on your phone. Um, they have a bunch of different Bible reading plans. I mean, hundreds of them. It's easy to go, get overwhelmed. But I was determined to find one that I thought you all could start with um, that gives you a good sense of the whole Bible story. So the one that I put on your handout is the essential 100. So this is 100, again, it's the same idea. It's 100 chapters from scripture um, that you can read over the course of a few months um, that takes you through the storyline of the whole Bible. So those are all three ways that you can read the Bible on your own. 
which is a great place to start. And you know, do what we talked about where you get a notebook and you write down your observation questions, your interpretation questions, and your application questions as you go through those different sections of scripture. But we also wanted to give you some ideas of how you can read the Bible in community. Um, I really do think that it's essential for us to do this practice, to get together with other believers and to read scripture together and to talk about what we're learning. Um, There's such a benefit to meet with people who are at different stages in their Christian faith um, and to hear from other, you know, journeys and other ideas and what people are learning um, just adds so much richness to our understanding of Scripture. That's really one of the essential practices of the Christian community, wherever it's been found throughout history, is reading the Bible together in community. We live in an individualistic society, right? And it's, it's very easy for us to have private devotional time. Even the phrase quiet time. How many of you grew up with the phrase quiet time? Like, have you had your quiet time? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's probably okay, right? It sounds like a weird, like a time out with God, like you're having your quiet time. If you don't, not inside the Christian subculture, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Have you had your quiet time? Like, what does that mean? I think it's good to read the Bible personally and privately. I do it all the time. But originally, the Bible, people didn't have their own copy of the Isaiah scroll. They didn't have the Bible. They could only come to the community and hear it read and hear it taught and discuss it together. And we've lost that a little bit, I think, Mm -hmm. in our culture. You should read the Bible in community. It's one of the best things you can do. Read it on your own and come together with other believers and talk about, what do you, here's what I was getting from this. Here's what I studied and discovered. I learn in community. C.S. Lewis, again, said, my own eyes are not enough. I would see through a thousand eyes. I would see through the world through the eyes of a gnat if I could. His point is, I want other perspectives on the world, especially when it comes to the Word of God. So we've given you four options here. Bible Study Fellowship is a group that meets. There's a group for men that meets in our church. Uh, There's a group for women that meets at another church. But this is very careful Bible study with um, small groups of folks that work through a chunk of Scripture at a time. Um, So that's a great option. Um, The Gospel of Mark study, I've actually, we're going to start one following this Intro to the Bible seminar. Mm -hmm. So we have two leaders that'll be up on the stage following our Q&A time. Um, If any of you are interested in joining a group reading through the Gospel of Mark, so that's the life of Jesus, it's a study that was written for beginners, so it's... And who wrote it? I wrote it. It's excellent. (laughs) It's very entry level, um, so no prior prior Bible knowledge necessary. Um, It's a good starting point. Um, So they'll be up here to sign you up if you're interested in joining that. And then small groups, um, if you participated in the book club at all this last year in Hebrews and Ephesians, you got those weekly emails. I was writing those for you guys, so... yeah, it's really fun. I love doing that. So that's, that's an option, too. We periodically will do that where we provide study notes based on what the sermons are based on. Um, so that's a great option. And then also women's Bible study. So those are just a few places where you can mm-hmm. read in community. I would encourage you, if you're new to this and you want to take a first step, the Mark study would be great. Laura did a fantastic job writing it. It's excellent. And we've already had some people go through it. And so uh, we will hear more about that at the end. But I would encourage yeah. you to consider that. Uh, let's, it's, it's, a, it's later than I thought it would be, but it's just not surprising for me. But it's 10 to 8, so let's take a, 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 a open up for questions. And if you have to go right at 8 o'clock, we'll pause at 8, introduce the, the study, and if you want to stay longer, we can. But are there any questions that you have that you want to ask for the good of the group? And I said this last week, I'll repeat it. If you have a question, you think, well, is it, is it a dumb question? There are no dumb questions, only dumb people who ask them. No, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. I just thought it was funny. Any questions good? Because it, you, it might be someone that somebody else has, and it would be helpful to, to hear it asked, so. Fire away. Any questions at all? I was anticipating one. And I thought, <laughs> look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let me repeat that for the recording. The question is, can you recommend some commentaries that'll be helpful in, in inductive study, observation, interpretation, application? Uh, commentaries are, uh, they're, it's an endless uh, stream. Right? I'll let Laura give her sure. best on this, but there's well, lots of them. Actually, N.T. Wright has a series. I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, oh. it's, it's, it's the book of the Bible, so the name of the Bible, so like Hebrews for everyone, yeah. um, either by N.T. Wright. Sometimes in these, he goes by Tom Wright, but they're written for regular church people. W-R-I-G-H-T. Yeah, W-R-I-G-H-T. Um, but 
It's the book of the Bible name and then for everyone. You know what we could do? We could email them. Yes. We uh, could email you. Uh, if you signed up and you, we have your email, we could email you a list of like, because commentaries can get really technical and endless. Maybe two or three of our suggestions for like the, the kind of base level commentaries mm -hmm. for And I will say a good study yeah. Bible is really a great helpful option. So some of you picked up those tonight. Mm -hmm. And also I have a list here. It, we ran out, but if you want one, please sign your name and we'll see if we can get you some information on those. But a good study Bible will have the Bible text on like the top half of the page, and then at the bottom, it'll have notes. Um, so that's a really great way when you're starting out. You know, if you're reading the scripture and you're like, what in the world is a Pharisee? And you read in the study notes and it tells you, here's what a Pharisee is. So those kinds of things I think are really helpful. It's a good starting point. And uh, you could pick up a Bible dictionary, uh, uh, a good, like NIV, Zondervan, uh, publish, not NIV, Zondervan publishes them, uh, mm -hmm. they're really, really helpful too, like just terms. Theological and biblical terms. Other questions? I thought for sure. We've answered all their questions. Oh, they're just like, oh, it's too much information. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I thought for sure somebody would ask this question, like what about different interpretations of the same passage? So I'm asking it. <laughs> Any of you ever wondered that? Don't Christians read the same passage and go, uh, we get different ideas there. Yeah. We talked last week about that we believe the word of God is infallible and inerrant, right? It's, the, it's, it's without error. That does not mean that I am or you are. That's like the basic understanding is even though God's word is without error, our interpretations can err and often do. But, uh, and so uh, since I asked the question, I'll answer it. <laughs> um, mo a lot of the times, disagreements or interpretations that vary come back to the, our understanding of Scripture. So some of the inter different interpretations fall into the camp of what Laura and I were just talking about, where people don't follow the interpretive process and they get wacky mm -hmm. views. But then you come to the maybe less frequent, but still, still there, times when Christians who are well-meaning, God-fearing, Bible-believing, and Jesus-following, and just disagree about like the mode of baptism or the way the church should be governed out of Scripture, or mm -hmm. we have, there's different interpretations and applications of these things. These fall into the category of what I, I think we would call non-essentials. In the, in the Reformation, uh, and the Reformers, it wasn't one of their five solas cries, but it was sort of a refrain they were known for. Um, and I don't know if it's officially attributed to Martin Luther, but it often gets attributed mm -hmm. to him. But anyway, they would say, in essentials unity, what are essentials? Who is Jesus? That's, remember, he's the primary interpretive lens. In essentials unity, um, who is Jesus? What does his death and resurrection mean? In non-essentials, liberty. How should we baptize? I think, I think I understand the Bible, right? I have a particular view on that. I think it's important, but it's not essential, mm -hmm. right? How should the church be governed? I think we have a particular view on that. We, we organize ourselves based on our understanding the Bible, but it's not essential. Uh, when is Jesus coming back? Like, the view of the end times. I have a particular view on that, but it's not essential. So in non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. I Meaning don't fight and hate and divide over these things. Mm -hmm. It gives Jesus a bad name in the world when you Christians fight about non-essentials. So in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, and all things, charity. So I guess what I'm saying is it's okay if it's not essential truth of the gospel for Christians to disagree about the interpretation of the passage. That doesn't freak me out. When people make appointments to see me as pastor and they have their little yellow pad sometimes and start asking me questions about doctrine, I know right where they're going. They have their litmus test. And it's almost always non-essential things that they're hung up on. What they should be asking is, is the word of God your authority? And what is the gospel to you? That matters, right? We gotta get that right. If you think of Jesus as a unicorn with purple wings, we can't, this, is not a, this is a problem, right? That's essential. Who is he? Anyway, um, there's more to say about that, but I'll just stop there. So I, I, I guess I would, oh, Lewis says we're in danger of what he calls chronological snobbery. Isn't that a great line? We think, well, ne whenever you hear somebody say this, well, the church has been wrong about this for 2,000 years, but now we know. Whenever you hear something like that, you should, warning bells should be going off, mm. right? Because the burden of proof is on those who would disagree with the common interpretation understood by Christians throughout the centuries. And very often on these matters, there's a unison of, of, of views mm. when you read through the, the, the church history. So anyway, <laughs> I, I was prepared to answer my own question. There you go. <laughs> Any other questions? I just figured it would come up. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yes.
Mm. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great, that's not silly yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's possible to be very familiar with scripture, but to not have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I think that's entirely possible. I think um, historically there have been people who have used scripture as sort of a weapon um, against other people. Because, and I would say that's largely because they're familiar with the words, but they, but they haven't really encountered a God that loves them and wants to dwell with them and wants to know them or wants to transform them. Um, so I think it's possible, but I do think the more time we spend in Scripture, the more we know God's heart, um, the harder it is to run from him when you, when you fully understand who he is. Um, but I do think it's possible. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible to know Scripture and not know God. There would, yeah, that, that's, I totally agree with Laura. Two parts to your question, and she nailed the first part, which is absolutely it's possible. Jesus says that in John 5. We read mm -hmm. that, right? You search the Scriptures diligently, but you don't understand the point. Mm -hmm. Those were Pharisees he's talking about, and they did have it almost all memorized. Mm-hmm. So it's absolutely possible to know technically stuff in the Bible, but miss Jesus. But you said something very interesting. Tell me your name. Sharon, you said, is it a feeling? How do you know if you have the mm -hmm. faith, right? That's a great question. Uh, Hebrews chapter one says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. And the apostle Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I if you're asking the question, how do you know if you have the faith that the Bible talks about, mm -hmm. it's who is Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Is he God in the flesh who came to live a perfect life that you can't live, to die in your place in payment for your sin, which you need and deserve that punishment? He takes it for you. And then his righteousness, his perfect life gets credited to your account. So you, you trade your unrighteousness for his righteousness, right? And righteousness is the Bible word for right living, like right standing before God. Who can be right with God? Nobody apart from Christ. He dies for you, he gives you his record, and then that you're made right before God. It's not, you don't always feel it. Sometimes you, I feel it, sometimes I kind of just muddle through. But it's becoming convinced that the Spirit does in your, in your heart and in your mind that Jesus is your Savior, that he did die for you, that you are, your sins are paid for, that he is Lord of your life. That's the faith, that's start to finish the faith. Everything else flows into or out of that. Mm. If you're convinced of who he is, you have that faith. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how you feel. Feelings come and go. You can eat a bad cookie and feel bad later tonight, right? <laughs> Just feel funny. Cookies right? are good. Feelings, yeah. That's a great question. We have one minute. Next question. Okay. Laura, will you wrap us up in prayer? Sure. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. We forgot. Leaders, Mark. Yes, we'll have them up on stage following the prayer. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear God, I thank you so much for this time together. I mm -hmm. thank you for your presence with us. I thank you for your word, uh, for scripture, that it, in it we get to see your heart for us and we get to know who you are and your desire to dwell with us. And I um, pray that every, all of us would uh, be more intentional about spending time reading scripture, that we would read the Bible um, and that we would encounter you in it. Thank you for this time, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. amen. Yeah, I, I meant to say this earlier, but I'll just I'll leave you with this after the prayer. Mark, as, as Steve comes on up here, and, and, and it, that's this. There's not, there's almost nothing more important in, in the, for the church today than for more people to be committed to this book. You're being bombarded with ways to make your decisions about life by all kinds of things that are outside of what God says, right? Not not just to be dependent on what I say or what Laura says or what the podcast says or what your favorite preacher says online but for you, men and women, to be committed to the word of God, to saturate yourself in it, to let it inform the way you think and see the world, that's like the most important, that's far more important than any program we could come up with or the best sermon I could give. It's for you to love God and, lo and know him through his word. That, that's a game changer in your life and in, in our culture, really. That's why we're doing this, so. Yay, thank you. <laughs>